Alrighty guys, so in this video we're going to do a virtual walkthrough with 2016 Coachman Ryan. It's exactly the same walkthrough that I do on the day of the uh, camper pickup except that in the real walkthrough you get to ask questions right away. In this one if you have any questions just write them in the comments and I'll make sure to answer. So we're going to do the outside, I'm going to show you all the hookups. Uh, and then we're gonna go inside, I'm gonna show you every feature. It's gonna be a pretty long video, but we're gonna put markers for different uh, features and different parts. So if, if you are looking for some specific uh, part of the video, you can look in the description. So let's go. Uh, first and foremost, the keys. You'll notice that they're color-coded because there's three different or actually four different keys uh, opening different uh, compartments and doors in the camper. And so you'll notice that the, uh, the key locks are colored with the same color, uh, like so. Alrighty, so going through the compartments, um, in here you will find uh, there's a couple chairs, there's a picnic table, patio mat, and also this cover. Uh, when it's folded, it will be in that compartment. So this cover goes around three windshields, and it goes around the corner of the door gives you some privacy from the front when you park. Out here we have a outdoor TV and the stereo. There is also a USB port available for charging the phones. Uh, we have one pan outlet right here for you to use. This is probably the biggest compartment in this camper. Uh, in here you will find the box with different uh, camping supplies. Uh, and most important for the black top griddle, which is stored inside, there is two pre-charged propane tanks and the adapter. So if you will be using the, the griddle, you will need some stuff from here. There's also a lot of camping gear that you might find useful for your trip. Below we have a sewer line. We'll talk about it more when we'll talk about the hookups. Also there is a toolbox. Um, trash can, collapsible trash can, and grilling supplies. Alright, going on the other side. On the back we do have a receiver hitch. Uh, we don't allow towing with our RV, however we do have two different options. Uh, you can have either a bicycle rack or a platform with a, a pretty big plastic tote and you can let me know which one you want for your rental. The plastic tote is great if you have a stroller or some large items uh, that there is no room for them inside. Uh, we have two bicycle platforms. One can hold two bicycles, another can hold four. And on this side, we have another storage, which is actually pretty much empty. The only things we have here, so these are so-called tire ramps. Say if you're parked on an unlevel surface and you need to level your camper and we have the uh, spirit levels inside. If you have to level, say if you have to raise the front, you just put those underneath like so and you simply drive up and they have three levels. One, two, and three. You just drive up onto the level you need. You use a handbrake to, to uh, kind of choke the camper in a position so it doesn't roll back. Also, if you want to level left to the right, same thing. If you need to raise one side, you just put it on the one side. Alright, so this is here. Now let's talk about the utilities and hookups. We have three points of connection at each campground. We have power, water, and sewer. And all the hookups are labeled here. You'll notice there's uh, labels on each even the smallest door so it's very easy to see what's where all right so short power is very easy you have the you have your uh, electrical cable that's a 30 amp service you plug it into your post uh, turn on the breakers and you're all set also inside here you can find it right from the top but there's a little adapter if you want to connect it to 110 outlet Say you park by your house or your friend's house and they don't have 30 amp, you can put an adapter and then just use regular extension cord and then you can connect to regular outlet. But remember, when you're connected to regular outlet, 
it's only 15 amps so most likely the air conditioner won't work uh, it probably will trip that outlet so this is your electrical hookup and you just pretty much stuff it back in there and close it now your second connection is water this is the storage for the fresh water hose you take it out usually fold it like in half then in quarters and then in eighths Put it in here. So one end will obviously go to your water connection. Just put it into your garden spout. This end, this is a water pressure regulator, will go right here. It's labeled as a city water connection. And you want to use the black one and just thread it in pretty tight. All right. Now, this blue valve gives you two different options and I have a label right here to explain what it does. If the valve is pointing down, this is so-called direct mode, so the way it is right now. Uh, that means that the water from your source is going directly to your faucets and sinks and showers, bypassing the tank. If you want to fill the fresh water tank, you just turn this valve to the side and so this is tank fill and now it will be filling your water tank. How do you know that your water tank is full? The excess water will just start gushing from underneath. It takes about, I would say, up to 15 minutes to fill this tank from complete empty to full. When you will be picking up this camper, the tank will be pre-filled for you and you don't have to refill it. Um, say you're just taking it for a trip, no campgrounds, no hookups you don't have to refill this water tank for me right so this is the water there's little instructions how to make it easier so it says turn to tank fill before disconnecting water hose so you want it this way when you're disconnecting the hose that's just relieves the pressure but when it's disconnected when hose is disconnected switch back to direct mode uh, that's to prevent water back flowing and just coming out from here all right, so this is your water. Now the sewer is right here. This is your sewer port. Um, the unit is equipped with two sewer tanks. You have a black tank and gray tank. Black tank is pretty much sewage directly from the toilet, all the nasty stuff. Gray tank is the soapy water from the shower and two sinks. So sewer hookup. We have our sewer line, this is sewer line support. Uh, inside the box you also have plastic gloves if you uh, feel that you need them. Um, Alright, so we're going to open this. The sewer hose goes right in here. The other end of the sewer hose will go into your sewer port, whether it's a dump station or you're at the campground and your campsite has a sewer port, you want to put it in, you can see there is a three threads, three sizes, so you can actually um, disconnect it, thread it in, and connect the sewer port. Uh, most of the campsites, they just have a three inch pipe and you just kind of push it in uh, to stay. Now, the order of opening the sewer valves is labeled. So you have one, this is the main valve, you have two, this is the black tank, and you have number three, gray tank. And I want to show you. So you open one, usually either nothing comes out or very little, whatever is trapped between these two valves. Then you open number two. Sometimes it might take a little effort, especially if you were driving a lot and some sand got on it. Uh, I usually, in my camping gear box, I include a spray, WD-40 spray. You can spray a little bit here. So, when you open the black tank, it's a rapid flush. So, for about 30 seconds, everything that's in the toilet is going to come out. Most common problem with the flushing black tank that I get from my renters is not enough water in the sewer tank. So what happens, there is too much solids, too much toilet paper, but not enough water to make a flush. So what you want to do before doing this whole thing is go inside, go to the toilet and just rinse, 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 rinse for maybe a good five minutes. Add as much water as you can to kind of dilute or water down whatever's in there. So you open the black tank, 
it comes out. Then, when you open the gray tank, it will follow up with all the soapy water that you have in your gray tank, and it will rinse your system. And doing in this method, usually when you disconnect the line, it will be fairly clean for you. Uh, if you still feel like you want to rinse this uh, sewer pipe before putting it back in, you have two options. You can either use at the dump station, they have the hose. Sometimes it says specifically for black tank or sewer hose rinsing. Or as an option, you can use the outdoor shower and just rinse it here. All right. By the way, the shower is a good feature. Doesn't mean you have to shower outside, but say if you have a pad or you have you're at the beach and you have some sandy shoes and flip-flops, it's always a good thing to, to, to rinse them off outside rather than bringing them in. All right, so you disconnect whatever is a leftover. Um, now, uh, a few words, dump station versus campsite. If you're at the dump station, so you pulled in or you're at the truck stop and you're just dumping and leaving, uh, you do it the way I showed. If you're at the campsite, you can also use this sewer line support. And basically, what it does, it just kind of, it literally supports the sewer line. And if your sewer port is really close to your camper, instead of like kinking the sewer line, you can make a nice loop and you can set your sewer line like this. So, a word of advice on refilling the fresh water tank and dumping the sewer. My rule of thumb is, if I'm not dumping the sewage, I'm not adding up the water. Uh, and I'll explain why. For example, your fresh water tank is about 45 gallons. Your gray and black water tank combined are 45 gallons as well. So you always have enough room to dump your onboard water However, say you pull into a gas station or some campsite that has water, but they don't have a dumping station. Now you're adding more water that you have room to dump. And that usually doesn't end well. Then say you're, you're, you have standing water in the toilet and the shower, because now say you have 80 gallons of water on board, but your sewage can take only 40. So like I said, rule of thumb, if you're adding water, you have to have a means of dumping your sewage and then you'll be good. So this wraps it up with utilities. A uh, few more things to show you on this side would be the propane refill. Uh, it's uh, very basic. This is the port. This is the propane valve open and closed. Uh, if you do need to refill a propane, that usually happens either in the late in the fall when you use a lot of furnace or if you're on a long trip. You just pull to a truck stop or gas station or a campground that has a propane refill and that's it. In this country, we don't allow refilling the propane on your own. You basically just pull in, you go to the register or to the office and say, hey, I need a propane. They will come, they will ask all the travelers to vacate their V usually and they will ask you if all the pilots are off and you can assure so just by closing this valve this will automatically kill any pilots in the camp they will refill the propane you can just follow up and make sure that this is open all right and the last one on this side is the gasoline refill yeah very self-explanatory it's a uh, unleaded fuel only uh, just be advised that just the way it's built it will trigger the pump prematurely so when you you fill you fill it sometimes the gun will click off at like three quarters and obviously if you're returning the camper you want to return it with a gas tank full so you might want to just look at the gauges inside and make sure it's full full so before we go in, I'll show you uh, around the door. Uh, the door splits, so you can actually have just the screen door. This also closes. Um, the door itself can be latched open so it doesn't fly back and forth. And we're actually going to do it right now. 
uh, your locks from the inside. This is your deadbolt right here. And this is your handle. So if you lower it, it will, uh, if you lift it up, it will lock your handle. Now, I try not to use this one when I'm camping because there's high chances that you can lock yourself outside. Uh, because if you leave your keys inside and you lock the handle, now it's locked and your keys inside. I prefer to use a deadbolt. Another very important thing is when RV is in motion, when you're driving, the door has to be deadbolted. All right, so whoever walks in last has to turn around and deadbolt the door. That's very important. All right, so moving on right by the entrance, we have a whole bunch of buttons. And this, while this might look confusing, actually they're all labeled. So if you take a little time, and you just go and read the labels it's all self-explanatory i still gonna go through and show you everything this is battery disconnect 99 percent of the time it's not being used by renters this is for the purpose if you're leaving the camper parked away and you want to shut off the house battery you turn it this absolutely kills all the power inside the rv including the fridge so if you use it, there has to be very specific reason uh, to use it. Normally, this is the so-called winter storage mode. Turn back on. Okay, interior lights. So that turns on a bunch of lights at the entrance. I'm gonna keep it on. The door sensor button, what it does is, if I turn it on, this step will retract and extract every time I close the door. Uh, when is it useful? Say if you're parked at the public areas, maybe Walmart or you're at some parking lot and you don't want the stairs to come out, you can use this option. Otherwise, it's, you know, it's not really convenient for the stairs to go in and out every time. So if you disable the switch, now it's not reacting to the door. However, the stairs will retract if you start the engine and your door is closed. So pretty much, I keep this bottom off 90% of my time. You have outside lights, that's that strip light out there on the top, and you have a front cap light. This is really nice when you park at the campground, you turn it on and you can see your camper from far away. All right, outing light. So when the outing is open, there's a LED strip and now the outing control. So this is just major on off bottom. When it's off, this part doesn't work. When it's on, all you have to do is tap. You don't have to hold it, so you have you click extend, and the outing will start opening on its own. And while it's opening, I'm gonna give you a little uh, safety speech on the outing. First of all, outing is the only thing, or one of the few things, that insurance won't cover if it gets damaged. All right, outings are very fragile. They can be taken off by the wind very easily. So my word of advice, if you don't have visual contact with the camper, meaning you walked away, you went for a hike, you went to the other side of the campground, you don't see your camper, your awning has to be folded. Overnight, same thing. It just takes a good gust of wind to rip this awning out and like I said in the beginning, insurance company will not cover it. It does have a wind sensor built in, this particular one, but you don't really want to get that far. Um, all right, so if you're not by the camper, if you're not using it, uh, you just hit the retract button and it hides in really easy. Okay, what else we have here is, uh, and now we're slowly getting to electrical, so I'm going to start talking both. This is solar panel control, and this is outlets over DC. And before I get into this, uh, I'm gonna give you a little speech on electrical, how, how it works. So camper, besides the car battery, like every regular car, it has also house batteries. And they're located right under the stairs, and what they do, they juice up everything that's uh, inside the camper, everything 12 volts. So that's your lights, uh, that's your fridge, that's the furnace, uh, water pump, USB ports, and stuff like that, all right? How do you recharge those batteries? Uh, there's a few ways. 
Uh, the easiest way is when you're driving, the alternator inside the engine, on the engine, is charging house batteries as well. Second way is the solar panel. So this unit is equipped with a solar panel and this is the panel. It's for reference only. You don't really have to click any buttons, plus there's actually only two buttons on it. It's doing it automatically. So if there's sun outside, it will be charging your batteries. And the third way is if you're connected to shore power, obviously like I showed you on the hookups, as soon as you hook up to any outlet, it will charge uh, the house batteries. And fourth way is running the generator. So we'll get at some point to the generator. Um, if the generator is running, it's not only producing 110 volts, it's also charging your house batteries. Okay, so now it's a good time to explain you this last gadget that's on this whole uh, panel. So this is called outlets over DC. So basically what it does when you turn it on, it takes the 12 volts from the batteries and converts it to 110 volts and feeds it to all the outlets and to the TV. Uh, a few examples when you would need it. Uh, the most common one is say you're driving and you need to charge a laptop and maybe your passengers want to watch a TV and you don't want to start the generator just for this purpose. So you can turn on this device and now you have 110 without hooking up. Other scenario, say you park somewhere, you're at the campsite with no hookups, and same thing, you, you need to charge your outlet, you charge your laptops or phones, uh, or you want to watch a TV, same thing, you turn it on, and you have 110. Uh, just uh, so you understand, there is limitations, so when this is running, uh, it's, it's basically a converter unit taking 12 volts from the batteries, converting it to 110 and giving to your outlets. If you connect, I guess, a rice cooker or a toaster or, or something really heavy duty, it will most likely trip this device and it will go into fault. That means you're just consuming too much energy. All right, so you have to be careful what do you plug in into the outlets when you're using uh, this device. Okay, so we are inside and the first thing that we have right at the entrance, strategically placed, is your command or control center, you name it. A lot of buttons, but same thing as with the other, they're all labeled and if you go through them, you'll, un you'll clearly see what it does. So, uh, let's go, I'll just show you what's where. In the middle, you have the house battery level. So, as we talked about electrical, this is where you can monitor and see your level. Uh, you don't have to understand all the voltage, but basically uh, when it's green all the way, that means that the battery is fully charged and it keeps charging. Um, orange is good, and when it gets into red zone, uh, and it will also start buzzing, and that means you have to charge your batteries. So that's your house battery level. Now going through the buttons, you have your water pump. If you turn it on, you can probably hear it. The water pump just worked a little bit and it stopped. Now, just so you understand, if you're hooked up to the water permanently, you're in so-called city water mode, you don't need this pump. The pressure from the outside will give you pressure. This is needed only if you need water uh, from your water tank. So this is your water pump. The next one is a gas water heater. You turn it on the gas heater turns on this light disappears i get quite a few calls from renters uh they're saying hey the heater is not working and i'm asked how do you know they go well the light turned off so if you read carefully this light is for the fault so actually no light means good this light will come out if your igniter died or something happened and then we have a problem so the heater uh, hot water heater is pretty small it's about uh, four and a half gallons uh, and it takes about 15 minutes 15 to 20 minutes to heat it up completely from from tap cold to nice and hot shower um, if there's few travelers there are few travelers and uh, you all want to take showers uh, you probably should have some timing between each shower otherwise the heater will not keep up this button, this is tank heaters. This is very specific just for the winter. If you turn it on, 
what it will do it will start heating all your tanks underneath this is frost prevention um, this is only for winter campers and usually I will talk about it more specifically upon the pickup but basically this unit is winter ready doesn't mean it will go into single digit you know uh, North Pole temperatures and survive but if you're within like low 30s mid 20s high 20s turning this on will prevent tanks and piping from freezing all right so we're going to turn this off what else we have here these are so-called status buttons when you press any of them these indicators will give you the the uh, corresponding level so lpg is your propane when you press and hold it you can see it says your propane is two-thirds battery is almost full but instead of using this we use this monitor for the battery then you have your fresh water black tank gray tank okay and you might have noticed like the black tank is showing full but just a few minutes ago we 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 emptied it right so what the heck so black and gray tank uh, just to understand how the levelers work in them it's pretty much like checking oil in your car uh, if you have a little leftover of the water or the camper just came from movement and stopped even a drop of water on that sensor will make the system think it's full so honestly the camper has to sit for like a good two days before these black and gray indicators will start reading carefully I normally go by fresh water and I know if my fresh water is about to empty, my black and gray tanks are about to be full. Okay, and the last but not least on this panel is the generator. Why do we need a generator? Two reasons. One, produce 110, uh, uh, 110 volt electricity. Uh, this will power up your microwave, air conditioning, and charge your batteries. This is the main reason to run the generator. Um, how to start it. I just actually made this little label uh, to make it more obvious for my renters but basically the way you want to do it you hold the you hold the prime button for five seconds what it does it it adds some fuel to the generator and you can actually hear a, a little noise and then you push and hold the start button until you hear a steady generator run so let's do it Once you hear this steady sound, you let the generator button go. Now, while it's running, I give you going to give you a few words. Generator is using the same gasoline as the engine. However, the generator will stop if your tank level, your car tank level, is less than quarter. All right. So when you arrive to the campground, just make sure you have plenty of gas. Now, if you look back here. So now generator is producing 110 volts. Uh, this panel lit up. And this is just for reference only. Just so you know, this panel just shows you how many amps you're consuming. It's kind of cool to see. And you might notice the batteries went all the way up. So it's charging, it's green. All right, so we know that the generator is working. Uh, to stop the generator, you just pretty much push the stop button and it stops automatically. Okay, moving on to the camper. Our next section is bathroom. It's pretty tiny, but it does the job. So I'll show you inside. We have a shower in here. There's a shower door. Um, important part is the shower handle has a kill switch. And if you're dry camping, boondocking, or you have limited water, instead of turning water off here, you can turn it off on a kill switch. Then when you turn back on, it's exactly same temperature. Uh, we got a toilet in here. Uh, it's flushed by the pedal down here. So if you push the pedal just a little bit, it will fill the water. If you push completely, it will also uh, flush everything. Um, underneath here, you have all sorts of cleaning supplies. Okay, and I'm going debunk the myth about the special toilet paper it doesn't exist all right 
um, the only paper you need in the camper is single ply. As long as it's thin, it's single ply like this, probably not the most pleasant to use, but it, it doesn't stick to the walls and then dissolves really quickly. You will always have, when you rent from us, you will have at least four, five, six rolls of toilet paper. There's other cleaning supplies. These pods are useful if you're using the toilet and you're traveling with the wastewater inside. You just take the pot, throw it in. What it will do, it will just hide the, the otters uh, from the toilet. Here you have some complimentary toiletries. All right. This is your main wardrobe. It's pretty large area, just to give you an idea. You can take a look if you can see it inside here. And you have towels in here and a safe deposit or safe box. There's also a battery powered vacuum cleaner. All right, uh, throw the camper, these shades, they're double privacy, so you have uh, uh, sun protection and you have full privacy. Up here you have a little fan. It works both ways, in and out, and it's very handy. I mean, if there are some smells, you can take them out, but also overnight you can set this fan to go bring the air in, and it will create a nice uh, draft throughout the camper and give you some fresh air. Okay, the kitchen, or the kitchenette, is right here. You got microwave, you got the stove right here. This is so-called explosion proof stove. So it takes a little bit of skills for knowing how to turn it on. Basically you want to turn it where this light matches the, um, the little knob. You push it down and then you create the spark. And then you let it go. So it's, it's made in a way, so if you just turn it on, your gas will not run continuously. So this is your stove. We supply the camper uh, with everything you need for cooking and prepping meals. You have a percolator, uh, toaster, French press, uh, some containers. You will find a three gallons or two and a half gallon of fresh drinking water. I discourage my ranchers to use this water for cooking or drinking, all right? Because it goes through a tank that was built almost a decade ago and uh, we don't have a means to scrub it every year. We sanitize fresh water tank with chlorine, uh, but we can't, you know, prove that it's uh, potable water. So for that reason, we recommend using the fresh water or filtered, actually filtered water. Uh, you have different cooking utensils. You have some condiments in here. There's always coffee, salt, pepper, sugar, and there is room for, for more items. Um, you have all sorts of plates, nesting pots. This is the handle for all the pots, so that's important to, to find. And you have all sorts of things in here, forks, knives, spoons, um, and stuff like this. Um, this is your sink. It lifts up or it will collapse or it will hide down. Uh, here you have a little pedestal with uh, USB and 110 outlets. A light switch, as you will find throughout the camper, uh, they're black on the dark background, so sometimes they're hard to find, but you will find there's one here, there's one more in here. This one's dimmable, actually. Uh, these ones are controlled by the knobs, and there's one more switch for the up front. So you have a whole bunch of them. All right, going back to the kitchenette, a uh, few words on the fridge. When you will be picking up your camper, the fridge will be already cold. So you can start storing your food right away. So you push down and you open. All right, this is the fridge. Now we did some modification to the fridge because we noticed if you stuff it pretty full, then some of the food is not getting all the cold air. So inside you'll find this gadget we just recently put in. Uh, it basically is just a fan and you can turn on and leave it on all the time. But what it does, it will circulate the air through the fridge and it has two speeds. I usually just use number two. All right. Um, also there's a freezer right here. So right now we are at 54 degrees. It will go colder. We just turned it on few hours ago 
it should go all the way down to 40, 43. Um, if your outside temperature is above 80 degrees, you can use this button. Uh, we just called it a fridge booster, but essentially what it is, it turns on a set of fans that dissipate the heat on the outside. This is a fresh add-on after my own trip uh, to south where the temperatures were like in hundreds, triple digits, and the fridge was just not keeping up. So I looked it up online. This is a good add-on. So use it only when outside air temperature is really high above 80, and you can see that your uh, temps in the fridge go up. And there's more storage in here. And this is the griddle that we talked about in the very beginning. It's just a black top griddle uh, that you can take out, set outside on the picnic table or on the table at the campsite and use it. Laundry hamper. Uh, this little pillow is a block off for the skylights. You just put it in like this to just if you want to keep the heat out. A few words on the skylights. So there's three of them in a camper. There's one here, one above the bed, and one in the bathroom. They all are rain protected. Meaning if you lift it up and you leave it up and it's raining, the water will not get in because it has a rain cover. So you can leave them in and they're actually pretty useful when you're driving and you open it, it will create a nice drift. Okay, so moving on forward, this is our AC control, AC and furnace actually. Um, this just shows the temperature inside the camper. Um, I prefer not to use on off button at all, so this is on all the time, but instead I'm using the mode button to go through different modes. Um, this thermostat has a whole bunch of them. We will need only three, furnace, cooling, and off. And basically by pressing off a mode button, you can go to cooling, you can go to furnace, which is the heat, or you can go back to off. And these two buttons, you can set the temperature that you want. If the thermostat will show you a fault code E7, that means there is no electricity. And that happens quite often. Renters message me quite often like, hey, we have a fault code. What they would do, they would come here and set it to AC, but the camper is not hooked up to anything or generator is not running. So your air conditioner is just simply not getting any electricity. All right, so that as soon as you hook up, uh, plug in your camper to a sure power or start generator, it will clear itself. All right, so this completes it on the AC living room area. You have a scissor jack uh, sofa or the couch, you name it. It transforms into bed very easily, just like so. I'd say it will sleep two people in a pinch. Uh, maybe two teenagers, two kids. We also, per request, provide a memory foam mattress that will go on top. Because I have to admit, sleeping in this, maybe for one, two nights is okay, but if you're sleeping on this bed, say for a week, it gets a little bit painful. So if you want, just let us know. We can give you a memory foam mattress that will fit and it will make your sleep more comfortable. To fold it back in, just lift it up, put it back. Okay, so on the other side of the living room, you have two chairs. Uh, and a little dinette table, so to say. Uh, the chairs have two levelers. There's one up front and one on the side. Uh, one leveler will allow the chair to go back and forward. The other one, I always forget which side it is, this one, it will unlock it from sitting straight position. And basically by using a combination of these two levelers, you can, uh, you can move up front and turn. Uh, the table, works like so. It has its own support, but for added stability, you have this little uh, rod uh, that goes just like so, and it will keep your table more stable. Uh, also, a few words on the outlets. You'll notice that all the outlets in RV have USB ports, and there's plenty of them. There's one here, one here, one underneath, one there, and there's one up front. Also, up here, there is a USB outlet specifically uh, for the phones. This outlet is all on the all the time. Even if your uh, outlets over DC is off, or even if you're not hooked up to the shore power, this outlet is always on.
And probably the best part about this whole tiny camper is the loft bed, right? Uh, this is the, uh, the buttons. So you simply press down and the bed magically comes down. This is the lowest position. So you just hold the button until it uh, rests on the stops. You will find the sheet uh, for this bed already put on because it's kind of uh, hard to put it. So we, we pre-put the sheet uh, on here. You will find the ladder sitting on this door. You take it out, you put it on the side and this is where you climb up. Obviously the bed has to be all the way up when you're traveling and when you're lifting up the bed, all the bedding except for this sheet has to be taken off. So you cannot leave the pillow, you cannot leave the comforter that will uh, disalign the bed. To bring it back up, just push the up button. All right, and a few more words on the bedding. Uh, we do provide the bedding per your request and it will be stored right here. So this is a set, this is two sets for two beds that includes pillows, comforters, sheets, um, comforter covers. And there is a set of towels in the bathroom. So if you opt in for the bedding, you will find it right here. And moving forward, we have a TV, which is not smart, unfortunately. However, the TV is hooked up to the Roku system, which makes this TV smart. Uh, it's preloaded with Amazon, Disney Plus, and Netflix accounts, but you're also welcome to use your accounts. And also in this Roku, there is about 40 movies that are preloaded and you can go to Roku Media Player and uh, play the movies just out of the hard drive if you have completely no connection. The TV is also connected to antenna. You can try to search for local channels. And as I mentioned on the almost very beginning, if you turn on outlets over DC, you can watch the TV, the passengers can watch the TV while you're driving. There's also a stereo system, you can connect your phone to it. And to complete the interior walkthrough up front on a passenger seat or between the seats, we have a little convenience bag with all sorts of chargers and things uh, that you might find useful. Also a few words on the storage. As we're done, you know, going through the RV, if you look around the way RV looks when you walk into it, this is how the RV should look when you guys are driving. It's very important. What I'm trying to say is when you're in motion, when you're driving, don't have any loose objects in the RV. This is a potential hazard. So say if you put a cooler right in the middle and you have to break uh, pretty hard because somebody cut you off or there's a deer in the road or something that cooler will go through everything on its way in the RV uh, Same goes on for any objects. So no kettles, no pots, no Blocks of water should be sitting. So when you're driving try to secure everything or store it where it has no room behind these seats It's a very good storage uh, for bigger items so if you have like a bag or a box or something that you cannot hide into any storage, you can put it behind here. Alrighty, this concludes the walkthrough of the interior. The next section we're going to talk is about driving and safety. Okay, and finally we got to the driving part. So pretty much this is the easiest RV to drive in our fleet because it's short. It's only 24 feet long. And it's built on the base of ProMaster, so it's essentially like driving a van. Um, there's nothing really special about driving it uh, in terms of uh, buttons or anything. It's uh, fully automatic. You have a handbrake on your left. Your air conditioning control is here. Um, you do have infotainment system right here. You can connect your phone to it. It does not have a GPS, just so you're aware. However, you have your trip computers um, and you have your compass. You, if you connect your phone, obviously you can uh, accept calls and text messages over the system, play the music, etc. Uh, what is particular for this RV that I do like 
I'm not sure if I have to run the engine for this. I probably do. So we're gonna start the engine. And what's particular is you have three cameras here, and they usually turn on once you start the engine. Uh, one camera shows on the back when you make a left turn. There is a left camera, and there is a right camera. You can also switch them manually, or if it sticks in one of the side cameras, you can press this V1, V2 button, and it will switch it over, toggle it between different views. Also, when you turn on reverse, it will uh, turn on this camera. I suggest driving with this camera on all the time, so you can see what's going on behind you. Uh, besides the mirrors and if you're driving at night this might be a little bit disruptive uh, you can just uh, turn it off all right what else we have here we have a USB charger this also shows you the voltage of the alternator uh, we have tire pressure monitoring system on top of the factory one which will show you just a sign that your tire is flat but here you can also see your tire pressures and temperatures. Uh, I just like to have it It's because we're supposed to check tire pressure before each uh, rental. This allows me not to walk around and check the tires manually. If it starts beeping, uh, you can snooze it by pushing uh, any of the buttons on top. But if it's beeping and show you some lower number like 58, that's still fine. It's just the center is you know, reading the discrepancy. Uh, but if it's beeping and obviously shows you zero, that means you do have a flat tire. Uh, it charges from solar, but you can also charge it from the USB port. Your registration and insurance will be found right here, or right here actually. So your registration insurance is right here. Um, uh, phone mount, so in the convenience bag, we include these metal plates, and you can either stick it to the back of your phone or put it between your phone and the case and those are keepers so you can have them and then you can set your phone right here and it's very convenient for your driving so I'm gonna shut the engine and talk a little bit about driving this camper so first of thing to remember is the height of the camper it's 11 feet so when you're driving around uh, if you see the bridge that's not labeled it's probably 14 feet or higher Okay, uh, at least in New York State, the bridges 14 feet and higher are not, uh, they're not mandatory, have to be labeled. Uh, if you see a bridge with a label 10.5 or 11 feet, you're definitely not going to clear it. Another thing to remember is when you're driving the residential roads, maybe like the streets uh, from your house or you're driving at the campground, remember about the trees and branches so try to stick to the middle of the road if you're driving on the side you have very high chances to hit the branch and it will either scrape or damage the roof or the siding the other thing to remember when you're driving this is that this unit is top heavy it has a lot of things built on the top so when you're cornering it when you're going into the turns you want to break before the turn and then slowly go into the turn. Also, when say you're exiting the highway or you're making it like a curve on the freeway, a lot of times you'll notice the yellow speed signs. They're so-called suggested speed. Uh, quite often we just ignore them. If we're in a car, regular vehicle, we can go 50 miles per hour at the exit that suggests us to go 30 miles. Well, those yellow signs are made for trucks and campers and buses. And since you're driving one of them, so if you take an exit and it says 30, 30, 30, 30, you probably want to do 30, 30, 30 uh, to avoid... Uh, the camper is not going to tip over if you go over 30, but you, you might have stuff falling off. Your passengers won't be as comfortable. So that's another thing to remember. Uh, comfortable driving speed for this guy is around 60, 65 miles. The other thing to remember is... When driving in the towns and cities with red lights and stop signs, you will need extra room to brake. Uh, and not because that this unit has inferior brakes, it has it has great brakes, uh, but with the passengers and stuff behind you, you want to brake more smoothly. So you want to just take more time and you don't want to go as aggressive on the brakes as in your regular car where everybody is strapped in with the seat belts. Uh, so for that reason, 
just in the cities I suggest go like five miles below the speed limit this will ensure the comfort of all the drivers the unit is also equipped with the easy pass and at the end of the trip we'll run the account and we'll see how many tolls did you get and we can either take it off your deposit or you can pay for it separately a um, few words on accidents roadside assistance and insurance so uh, most common is if you do have a flat tire all you have to do is safely pull over and give me a call or if you're renting through the platform you can call the roadside assistance that's provided through the platform and you will have to give me or them very exact coordinates you can give uh, you can use Google Maps to send a drop pin but it has to be very exact address we will dispatch you a uh, roadside assistance they will come and they will replace your tire uh, you will be financially responsible for the replacement tire and you may or may not be responsible for roadside assistance that depends how much they charge like on my commercial account we get four hundred dollars per incident so if I'm not paying anything for roadside assistance you're not paying either if I have to pay something on top of those 400 we will transfer that uh, payment to you uh, it, obviously if you do have an accident same thing get to the safety contact us we will walk you through um, just so you understand and that's the reason why we ask people to provide their liability insurance the insurance that's included with this RV does not cover liability. It covers just the RV. So say if you're involved into accident and there's damages to the third party uh, vehicles or property and it's a driver's fault, your own liability insurance should take care of it. Our insurance will deny any liability claims. Okay, well, since we got so far in this video, I know it's pretty lengthy, but it's exactly the same what we would do if I would do your walkthrough in person. If you have any questions during your trip or you're doubting or you're not sure whether you're doing it right or wrong, we have a very handy poster in here that you can refer to and just find the topic that you need and just go through it will give you a like a refresh a couple of things that i would like to mention here is here are all the emergency numbers for roadside assistance including my phone number also these are drop off instructions for your last day of travel so just read through follow them and it will walk you through this one the red one it's called check before takeoff this is very important it's like a pre-flight check I basically suggest that at the beginning of every trip, like say you stopped at the gas station, now you're, you continue your drive, someone walks here and read this section loud. And I guarantee if you follow these checks, your trip will be safe and worry-free. Um, this concludes the walkthrough. Uh, thank you for watching. I know it was a long video. If you do have any questions as you watch this video before, uh, feel free to write in the comments or in the email and I actually encourage you as I do it through in-person walkthrough at the end of my uh, tutorial I also ask my renters ask me three different questions uh, think uh, specifically for your trip which situations you might have which scenarios that maybe I didn't cover and you're very welcome to to either write it in the comments or address me directly and I'll be glad to uh, answer them and happy travels.